Uh, thank you very much, Pedro. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today and to speak to you about some of these issues and at least raise points, which I hope will be the basis for discussions. We have a lot to, to do now, and it's important that we work together uh, to achieve those aims. And uh, I, I intentionally, some of my comments uh, have been in the publication and in what I'll say somewhat uh, controversial. Well, Pedro has already mentioned a bit of the history at the uh, Edinburgh Congress. We made quite a lot of progress in the ballot as to what direction people wish to go as uh, towards uh, a unified system of nomenclature for fungi, which many of you will be aware of, or were actually at the meeting itself. This was followed by the meeting here uh, last uh, spring, the De 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 uh, Amsterdam Declaration, uh, where everybody agreed we should come to the end of dual nomenclature. We should adopt priority for competing names, except where the younger was better known. We should follow the first to make a choice and prepare lists of names to, to be preferred and that choices should be registered. And we should also declare simultaneously names uh, published after a certain date as illegitimate. Well, at the Congress uh, in Melbourne uh, last July, it was really a, a, a major change in nomenclature took place after very detailed discussions and publications before the meeting, during the meeting, and so on. The ballot was taken, and we'd obviously come to a tipping point with the community at large. And it's important to understand that this was not just a matter of getting to a single uh, nomenclature for fungi at the same time the Congress decided it wanted a single name for fossils of all groups. So this was part of a general feeling in nomenclature to move from this issue. So the dual nomenclature provisions ended on the 30th of July and uh, they actually came into effect immediately then, although publications have been coming out of course in the interim. Uh, which people don't learn about these rules changes very promptly and uh, some effective dates are not until uh, January next year. We've, uh, Meredith has talked about the different tombstones that mycology has laid to rest and now we have one for uh, pleomorphic uh, fungi and I think it's important that we realise this, this has happened and we, that we move forward in a constructive way. Well, the Melbourne Code did various things to do with the pleomorphic fungi. It ended the provisions permitting dual nomenclature. It agreed that the normal rules of priority by date and other general provisions of the code uh, should be applied subject to some safeguard, regardless of the, the morph. It introduced new provisions to ensure continued legitimacy and validity of names that have been published uh, in the previous codes. And this is where the magic uh, 1st of January 2013 date is very important to bear in mind, but this does not uh, legitimise those practices after that date. And it also instructed that unfamiliar anamorph typified names shouldn't be taken up where there was a widely used telemorph name without authorisation by the General Committee uh, on Nomenclature. And lastly, it authorised the production of lists of accepted and rejected names which could be accorded protected status by the General Committee. This is very important because this applies to all fungal names. This does not apply just to those where pleomorphism involved. It is in fact what used to be called lists of names in current use, which in the case of uh, mycology, we did have a precedent with the uh, work of John Pitt and colleagues for the Trichocomacy. Uh, but this was a very major step uh, which we can all take note of on a broader front. So we have a vision of where we want to go, uh, but where do we, we have to accept though where we are. We wouldn't start in this position of uh, inadequate taxonomies, inadequate detailed information on names uh, if we had a choice, but we have to start from our present position. So the comments in this presentation aim to stimulate this debate and movement along that road to the goal that we all I hope now want to achieve and will mycology wishes to achieve. So these comments are being made without prejudice and this is a reservation made on the statement or offer that's not an admission 
uh, or cannot otherwise be used against the issuing party in future dealings or litigation without a detrimental uh, legal effect. So they all come with a health warning, okay? So we try not, try not to trip up. We don't want too many trips along this road. Well, there are quite a lot of issues that we need to think about. How many of these can be dealt with at this time, I'm not sure. We have to define widely used. We have to correct author citations. Consider how we decide whether names are part of a holomorph. We have to look at the typification issue, whether we still want uh, tele teleotypes, whether we should have anatypes for an anamorph types whether there should be registration of choices of typification, best practice for informal designations, which some people are very keen about. We must look at what goes into the lists and the mechanisms of developing lists and their timetables, and also how this relates to the use of the existing procedures for conservation and rejection, uh, which are still available now. When defining uh, widely used, there are two examples that are proposed to go in the code and are in the proof of the code at the moment. Uh, one is that a uh, wide, widely used name like penicillium can be used over eupenicillium immediately without any problem. And uh, capnodium uh, can be used over polyketon, again, without any problem being very well known. So this is really the, the key. Where we have this situation, there's no need to have any delays. If we look at databases and indicator, which has all sorts of warts and problems and so on with them, there are cases where it's quite clear what the community wants. And when we think of the community, it has to be all the people that use fungal names for whatever purpose in industry and in health and communication, so any, any aspect of science. And this is one case, histoplasma and gelomyces, where it's very clear that most people are using histoplasma by a huge amount. And so that's an easy one to go with without any more ado. There are problems with bibliographic data, bibliometric data in the databases, usage in different groups of organisms and so on, uh, which you can see up here. And so all these things have to be used with considerable caution. And we have to decide when to refer things to a committee. And I think uh, it is quite possible that one of the indicators of this can be when numbers are very similar if we do these course searches. And this is one example uh, in this case here. So guidelines on these issues are needed. There are a number of players that can be involved in this. The Megalithic Committee for Fungi is, of course, the authoritative body in this respect. And it's very good that Lorelei is here and Scott uh, Redhead to uh, advise on that aspect. The International Commission on the Taxonomy of the Fungi, which has a more advisory and a broader remit than the, that. And the International Mycological Association, of course, is the, the main international body involved and perhaps there should be some sort of joint working group. I don't know, but we have to think about that. Correcting author citations is quite easy. This is an example in the code already, uh, which is being revised, so it reflects the new rules where you just have to make a very small change. Uh, but th this, this can be done, I think, all the time. If you find one of these, just, just do it and make sure Paul Kirk knows about it. I think it's the answer to that. How we determine whether there are holomorphs there. There are different approaches to this. Some people would like DNA data for everything. There are, of course, problems with that. So the single ask spore isolations are very good. Co-occurrences are important. Should some guidelines be provided for that? I don't know. Perhaps another task for the ICTF. But I think the important thing to remember is that we make taxonomic decisions all the time in deciding that a particular state belongs with a different state is a taxonomic decision no different from any of the other taxonomic decisions we make at the moment based on the morphology. So we have to think about that. The situation with typifications I already mentioned, should we want sequence epitypes to be designated for uh, pretty well everything on the list? Should we keep teleotypes and anatypes, a new term, to be designated for a particular taxa? because there can be a problem if something's already got an epitype for a different reason, then you can't actually uh, follow the regular procedures. Uh, this is a, a thing that Scott Redhead uh, brought our attention to very forcibly before the Congress. If we're looking at registration of choices, if people are making decisions but, uh, because things are widely used, how is that recognised? How are new typifications taken note of easily? Should the formal publication be required? 
uh, which can now be online, of course, as well as on paper, would deposit to these choices in a recognised uh, depository in, uh, for names be accepted as it is, without anything else? And should there be a requirement for all recognised repositories when that is decided by the, the Manchester Committee for Fungi uh, to perform those jobs as well? There's also the issue of informal names. This was advocated very strongly in one of the uh, really pioneering uh, publications on this issue, edited by Keith Seaford and colleagues in the 2000. Uh, is it desirable, essential or necessary or unnecessary? And how should this be done? Is this a chance to start using words like, like morph rather than anamorph from teleomorph? Because people who are not in mycology never know what a teleomorph or anamorph is anyway. Uh, content of lists of names, what, should be, what ranks are we dealing with? Should we approach by order of family or whatever? Should genera be tackled first? Should we try and deal with in, in specific taxa? Should like conforming taxa be included? This, this, this uh, was uh, an exception put into the code, uh, largely through a misunderstanding, and, uh, and I think this, this needs to be written about separately. I'll write a separate proposal, I think, about this fairly shortly. There's no reason that uh, exception should be there. What information is required or desirable in each entry, uh, we need to think about. As I say, we have a good example of this with the Trichocome AC pioneering work, which was updated by the uh, International Commission on Aspergillus and Penicillium in 2000, but that version has not been through the Congress. This version was accepted by the Tokyo Congress uh, in 1993. And that's, that's the, what the entries look like there, but we perhaps ought to have more information about what the, uh, the actual types are from and so on. And we won't need to use words like type necessarily, because whatever we do is protected, so we can choose whatever types seem to be desirable. Uh, the entries probably will need to look like that eventually, because this is the format used in the current appendices uh, of the code. So that's probably a model to think about there. So when we come to developing uh, lists, this is going to be uh, something that is quite a big task, but it's important to realise there doesn't need to be a committee. Anybody can develop a list. I think that's one of the first things to think about. The list that will then be vetted by the Nomenclature Committee for Fungi, and they may appoint committees or whatever uh, in association with other bodies or themselves to actually vet these. When they've been approved by the Nomenclature Committee for Fungi, they then go to the General Committee, which oversees all uh, groups covered by the, the code, uh, and they will decide what goes to the next uh, Congress, ultimately. That's normally just, just a formality, but sometimes uh, there are hiccups on the way with other proposals. We have to consider, I think, or think about how the bacteriologists proceeded in the past with their lists of being prepared, uh, sorry, what the, uh, and the International Commission on the Zoological Nomenclature, I think, is about to actually publish uh, uh, procedures for how they handle things in zoology, uh, which may be worth looking at when that's available. So I had a quick go at a, a timetable, and I think if we're going to get to things in a good state for the uh, Congress in 2017, then we need to get quick and dirty lists out soon, certainly by the end of this year. We need to get mycologists expressing interests in either serving on committees or helping committees or whatever uh, that are established by the Nature Committee for Fungi, uh, with preparing a more detailed list by that time. We need to encourage comments and corrections probably by about the middle of next year, and then have the NCF mandated committee and subcommittees consider what they receive by that time. Not sure what's happened there. Uh, that we need to get revised lists of those out after consideration. <coughs> And then we'll need to have a chance to have a poll and discussion of these at IMC 10 in 2014. When those revisions are actually done, we need, uh, obviously there will be corrections and so on. We need to end up with something that can go to the general committee, which I would guess is probably going to uh, take to about the end of 2014 with how, sorry, 15 by how these committees work. The general committee's then got to look for them. And if you want a body that works slowly, that has to be the general committee. You can have five years without a message about anything. But hopefully that will change now with new people involved. But it's not the fastest of operations. 
So we'll need lists prepared for the Congress in 2017. They will then appear as appendices in, in the code, which probably will just be online, then they may be hard copy, they'll probably just be published online. And, but, but if you do that, the, what is decided in 2017, the operative date normally would be 2019. And the point is, if we miss these slots, if you miss that 2019 deadline to get anywhere, you're going to be thinking about 2025. So this is something we have to start moving fairly quickly on. And as Scott pointed out in an email to which I think really encapsulates things, things moving slower than some would like and too fast for others. And I think everybody here would endorse that. So the, the other thing we have to resolve is the issue of uh, how we use existing procedures at this time. It may be there are controversial cases or ones that could be solved very quickly uh, by proposals put through the conservation system and there's no uh, theoretical objection to this, these procedures going on. But is it sensible to do this when lists are being prepared and going through the vetting system? Uh, the guidance from the Committee for Fungi is really needed on this issue as to what, what they will or will not consider because we don't want them to be any more overloaded with work than they are and we have to be careful we don't want to make decisions that we may want to uh, regret later. Anyway, I've tried to be the dummy here so you can all throw skittles at me uh, but we have a lot to address and I think we, uh, we can achieve a lot but at the same time we have to work together towards that. We have to accept what has happened we, we wouldn't start from here, but we have to start from here. And we do have some fairly tight dates if we're actually going to achieve this uh, on a wide scale uh, in a reasonable time. Thank you.